Good morning and welcome back as we continue our series on 2 Corinthians and today we will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 11 and this is uh, revealing Paul's heart and the theme here would be divided into three portions you know verses 1 to 4, 5 to 10 and verse 11 and the idea behind this us this Paul is trying to teach us a few things here one love second restoration and third know your victory be aware how to live in this world and beginning in verse 1 to 4 Paul begins to speak here and he talks about you know Paul is talking that there is something that has happened in the church that is causing him pain now in when you look at the scriptures um, many times people some people believe that the sin that is caused here in verse 1 that uh, caused Paul a great deal of pain was not a health issue but it was a spiritual issue uh, some people believe that uh, the sin that was happening in the church was the same thing that had happened in first corinthians chapter 5 the person was living in an immorality or the second issue could be that someone had challenged publicly paul's apostolic authority and they had challenged him and and this had brought confusion this had brought uh, pain in the church and personally to paul also and paul begins to speak about this here and he says you know that I could have come and I could have spoken toughly, but he's revealing a shepherd's heart. He's saying, he's dealing the situation with lots and lots of love. He's saying, I could have come and I could have dealt the situation straight away. You know, I could have been tough. I could have uh, handled the situation instantly. It's not that I cannot, but I choose, you know, I choose to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And how does he handle it? He handles it by love. And that is, that is the first indication that a person is walking in the spirit is when they have love. And here he begins to say, he's like, you know, it's not that I could not do it, that I'm going to speak the truth, but in love. And I'm going to deal with the situation in love. That's so much like Christ, you know, he's, the situation is tough. The situation is there. But what is Paul trying to say? In his, in his, diff in his different ways, Paul is beginning to say to the person here, he's like, for if I cause you to sorrow, then who will make me glad? But if I am made sorrowful, and the idea is, he's basically saying is, if I cause you to, if I, by my words, if you become sad, then when I have to fellowship, then who will comfort me? Sad people. And therefore, I do not want to be tough. And I want to reveal love. And with patience, we will deal with the issue. And this is so much like Christ, you know. I was thinking about this, that how many people need to be loved? How many of us want and have a desire to be loved? All of us. There is not one person who says, I don't need to be loved. I don't feel that I should be loved. We all have that vacuum in our heart. We all want love. We all want that deep love. And Christ gives it to us. But once we have received this love, once we have get to know this love, then it's also important to share that love. Deal with situations in love first. And then in the capacity that we can. And, you know, and... He begins, he's saying this here, that if I hurt you, then who will make me glad? You know, Who will make me glad? Verse 3, this is the very thing I wrote to you, so that when I come, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, but having confidence in all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. In verse 4, for out of much affliction, anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Who is hurt? Paul. There is a man who is challenging his apostolic authority. There is a man who is rebelling against him, who is going against him. And challenging his authority or this could be a person who has uh, practicing sin openly in the church and who is it causing problems to Paul Paul is saying he is the one who is hurt but how is he approaching it with love and tears he says I am writing to you in tears in verse 4 not that you would be made sorrowful but that you might know the love which I have for you like this is true love right he approaches the issue with love he does not approach the issue with hate, with control, with anger, with I can put you in your place. No, he's not, none of those things. He's talking straight away. He's talking with love. And he begins to restore the person, you know. And with, I, I'm writing to you with tears. He's putting the interest of the Corinthians before his own interest. He's the one who's hurt, but he's more concerned about the Corinthians. And that's like Christ, isn't it? Like at the cross, when he's being crucified, what are the words that are coming out of the Lord's mouth? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. You know, <clears throat> he says to the thief, today you will be, who was mocking him, today you will be with me in paradise. He's saying <clears throat> to John, this is your mother. 
to fulfill scriptures, he's saying, I thirst. Like Christ is occupied with others, with us, not with the hurt that he's going through, because in the end, he gives us a victory. And so that's what he's saying here, you know. And I was thinking, I want to read First Corinthians chapter 13 and understand this love. And I, I made a pledge that I'm going to read this <coughs> chapter like 10 times this week. And I want to understand, you know, what true love really means. Because we may think we know how to love, but actually we don't know. You know, the first eight verses of 1 Corinthians 13 are amazing. And if we just stop, pause, think about them, you know, it will change our mind. It will change our mind. Also, tomorrow is Thursday, our first Thursday. And so I thought, let's just keep this time for fasting and praying. I mean, maybe miss a meal. If you can fast, great. If you cannot fast, great. But how about fasting from our phones for an hour and just going to God and saying, God, cure. God, provide. God, heal this land. God, heal our hearts. You know, God, put an end to this virus. Put an end. Find a cure, oh, Lord. <clears throat> so many lives are lose. We are losing so many lives. God, just intervene. Do something. And just let's pray. You know, and let's intercede tomorrow. And use this time. And, you know, we, what are we doing? We are just revealing the love that God has put in our hearts. Maybe we cannot go out right now and give those tracks. But think about it. Like right now, the many tracks that have been distributed. Someone is probably picking up that track. Who they kept it in their book, in their pant, in their bag. Or just left it on a dressing table or in a drawer. And what if they take it out now and they are reading it? Now it will make more sense to them. And let's just pray for such things to happen. That the hearts of people... You know would change and <clears throat> hearts of people would change so let's continue to do that and verses 5 to 10 he begins to speak about discipline and so that's love but verses 5 to 10 is discipline but also the key thing here paul talks about is restoration he says this man is disciplined he begins to say in verse 5 if anyone has caused sorrow he has caused sorrow not to me but in some degree in order to say not to say too much to all of you like, okay, he went against, he did those things that he had to do, but not only to me, but it, it has caused trouble in the church too. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive, comfort him, otherwise such a one may be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. What is interesting to see is here is Paul does not take the name of the person, does not name the sin of the person. And that's like, you know, that's amazing that he's not even mentioning what it is. But he says that that person is probably repented and the church knows about it. And that's why, you know, now is the time to comfort this person. Otherwise, he will be excessively sorrowful. Like when there is repentance, you know, don't hold back. Go and love the person. When the person is repented, turn around, love the person back. Don't hold these things in your heart. And that's what he's actually saying. You know, that maybe this man has now, you know, maybe this man has now done this. And of course, when there is a problem, then there is discipline comes in in Hebrews chapter 12. Like God does it because the motivation for the discipline is love. It's not to put people right into their place, but course correction, bring them right back on track. That's the idea. And the two important path, truths that come out of this passage is how do you deal with someone who is living in sin or causing trouble or, you know, and second is what do you do after the person repents? Now, both are important. You cannot say, I know how to deal with the problem. But once you deal with the problem, then how do you deal with the person who has done the problem when they repent? And they're both important. Now, we know we have been taught in our ministry that there are these three areas, you know, when the person is living in immorality or financial, causing financial trouble and, you know, or there is a doctrinal issue. Then these are the issues that come up. And if there is something going on, then we approach the person. We don't just say, okay, let it forget it. What happens, whatever happens, happens. We approach the person. But how do we approach the person? With an attitude of love. Matthew 18, Jesus said, if you go to the brother alone, then you have won a soul. You know, so Matthew 18, 35. So that's the way of discipline. That's the way of discipline in the church. Again, remember, what's the heart behind the discipline? The heart behind the discipline is restoration. You know, <clears throat> why we want to win the brother or the sister back. That's the whole idea. So the first way is you go to the person alone with a heart of love and confront lovingly. Speak the truth in love. Why? To bring the brother back or the sister back. The second way is if they don't listen, then you take two or three witnesses. Again, the idea is to comfort, to encourage. Yes, we confront, but confront 
with love so that you can restore the person. And if they don't listen, then tell the church. Again, Paul is saying here, the reason why is that is so that you bring him back. Because I love verse 8. He says here, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Reaffirm your love for him. If a person willingly does not want and, you know, is living in sin and says, I'll do as I please, and okay, then you can ask the person to leave. But if there, there is genuine repentance, then restoration comes in. So yes, we deal with the issue, but then how do you deal with the person? The deal with the person is in love. Restore the person. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, you know, because we all need restoration. Haven't we been restored? You know, I was thinking of this, I was thinking of Peter. How many times was he restored? And how did Christ restore him? In love. Like, this is a man who is denied the Lord at his, maybe the most difficult time in his life. And Christ comes back after his, at the resurrection and goes after Peter. So this is not waiting for Peter to come to him, but Christ goes to Peter. That's the heart behind restoration. That is what Paul is saying here. In verse 9, he is saying very simply, For this end also I wrote, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Wow! So Paul is saying, listen, after you have forgiven, after the discipline has happened, after those things have happened, now is your test. What are you going to do? Are you going to reveal love verses 1 to 4? Or are you going to restore verses 5 to 10? You are being put at test now. Will you restore? And that's the whole idea because <clears throat> true forgiveness will include those things. When what does true forgiveness include? You know, It includes not bringing up the sin again, not talking about it again, not passing it on again. And also, when you, when you meet with the person, you don't remember it. Now you say, I, it's difficult. Of course it's difficult. But that's why the Holy Spirit in us, when we are spirit-filled, then we will not remember. Now remember, I'm talking about church discipline, what Paul is saying. But this aspect of forgiveness and restoration is applicable to all areas of our life, all, our, all spheres of life. Yes, it's in church discipline, but it's also in a, in a marital relationship between a husband and a wife. Like, issues can happen, but there should be forgiveness, approach in love, forgiveness and restore. Because in the end, you will have a victory. And I'll come to that in a little while. It could be between parents and kids, you know, between teenagers and the family members. It could be between relatives. It could be between a brother and sister in church. It could be between brothers. It could be between sisters. It could be between anything and anyone. But remember, true forgiveness and restoration will heal any situation. True forgiveness, restoration, loving the person, they will heal any situation, you know. <clears throat> and that's, Paul is outlining it for us. Because in the end, forgiveness, restoration, love, these things will bring us a victory. That's what the key thing is, you know. So, you know, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, be tender-hearted, forgiving, loving one another, you know. And, we have the greatest example, you know, we have the greatest example, Christ. Like, did, does Christ love us when we sin? <laughs> you know, does he stop loving? Of course, the fellowship stops. A fellowship that is broken for a little while till we repent. But once we repent, uh, does Christ forgive us? Does he restore us? Does he bring us back into his fellowship with him? Does he do those things? Of course he does. So when we are doing these things, it is not to impress people. We are doing these things so that we can be more Christ-like. You know, and do we fail? Of course we fail. But the idea is when we fail, we get up, we learn and we practice it again. You know, because we will fail, others will fail. This is going to happen. It's not something that we are perfect and nothing is going to, we are not going to offend anyone or we are not going to never sin. These things will happen, but it does not mean we continue this way. It means we need course correction too. And then that's how we learn and that's how we go ahead. So that if someone else does it to us, then we also have the attitude of loving, forgiving, restoring, and then move on in victory. Because if we remain back, if we remain back, if we hold on to all those things of what the other person did, or what they did, or what they did, this one did, or that one did, if we keep on holding on to it, we will never experience true spiritual victory. We will continue to live in bondage. And that's what he says in verse 11. Now carefully listen to this, what he says. He says, so that no advantage would be taken of us by the devil, by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. Like, think about it. He starts with love. He comes to forgiveness, restoration. And then he tells you, if you don't, then there is someone who is waiting to take an advantage of you. In what way? You know, 
if you live in unforgiveness if you live in hurts if you live in bitterness if you live in those things then the enemy will take advantage and he will bring in a wedge he will bring in division he will bring in air between people and that's not what we want you know that's not what we want because we are children of god and this is where we are and maybe this has happened in the past maybe this is happening presently whatever the situation may be let go love give love restore forgive and move on and live in victory because you know <clears throat> these these things are like he is saying we are not ignorant and as believers we don't want to be ignorant of spiritual warfare don't ever think oh you know the enemy or oh, he won't do anything to me listen he deceives the whole world he keeps the gospel from the whole world he blinds the eyes of the people if he has the power along with his satanic army to deceive the people and keep their eyes closed towards the gospel do you think he has more power than you like imagine who did he go after first he went after peter he's telling peter he is using peter to tell jesus don't go to the cross if we are not careful then the enemy will use us you know and so that's what he is saying here like think about it you know that he has devices he has methods he has power he has all those things be at be careful that he does not take advantage of you but remember this that we don't live have to live afraid because we have a victory we have a victory and that's the key point in verse 11 that i want to bring out is yes we are not ignorant of his devices because we know who we are in christ we know how we stand in christ we know our position and we know how to live in christ you know and yes we can fail but we are going to go back and live in victory and here are a few verses to encourage you because remember christ is our protector our minds colossians chapter 3 should be set on things above not on things of the earth the holy spirit is our guide he guides us the word of god is a protection the word of god is a weapon and we push back the work of the enemy by the by meditating and you know implementing the word of god in our lives and this is this is it you know in luke chapter 10 verse 18 jesus said i saw satan fall from heaven like lightning so he is not someone yes he is powerful but he cannot win over us we are victorious ones because hebrews 2:14 by his death Jesus overcame him by his death. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 on the cross he spoiled principalities and powers. And so just by looking at the scriptures we can understand how can we live and you know the devices the methods of the enemy how can we go against and gain victory over it. Remember who you are in Christ remember what Christ has done on the cross. He defeated the principalities and powers his death he has overcome. He has overcome you know and in remember in in Joshua chapter 10 verse 24 these is five kings who go against uh, Israel and they run away and in the battle they lose and they go and then how how does Joshua and the team go back and defeat these kings are hiding in a cave they bring them out they put their neck on they put their foot on their neck subjugation you are under our feet you know and because of who we are in Christ the devil is under the feet of Christ and so we live in that you know, and here how do we keep ourselves strong how do we keep ourselves safe and protected so that the enemy cannot come in and cause division or cannot come in and cause confusion ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18 you know be strong be strong put on the armor of god you know be strong in the lord put on your spiritual armor live in his power romans chapter 8 verse 37 remember who you are more than conquerors in christ you are more than a conqueror in Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 be strong in his grace like have a grace heart you know a grace heart is a great heart you know and that's how we live when we give grace then we are revealing Christ then the enemy has no place 2 Corinthians 12 9 i am weak but when i am weak then Christ strengthens me full he comes he comes inside of me and so when i am weak then i'm strong you know the word is when i feel like helpless and i'm as strong as dynamite you know i'm dynamite when i'm when i'm helpless and that's the heart like remember this that oh i cannot get victory you can when you're weak you allow god to come in then god is like the dynamite you know god is like the dynamite he'll make you as strong as dynamite and second in joshua chapter 1 you know verses 7 to 9 be strong and courageous meditate upon the word and you will have victory you know Yes, we are not ignorant of his devices, but we know how to get victory. Yes, there is love, there is restoration, and when we do those things, we stand in victory. You know, we stand in victory because this is what God has commanded for our lives.
And so let's continue to pray, intercede and courage. Tomorrow, Thursday, let's have our fasting and praying at home. Whatever you can, if you can fast, great. If you cannot fast, great. But pray for a cure, <clears throat> Lord, for healing, for protection, you know, and for wisdom. And all the government authorities and everyone who's trying to help, like God, just keep those things. Lord. God, help us. Medical professionals, God, help them, God. Hospitals, those who are working overtime tirelessly, let's just keep them praying for them and lift them up and say, God, help such people. We are here. So we ask you and thank you for listening in and then we will continue with this time, uh, future in the days to come and hope this has encouraged you. Okay. So remember, love, restore and stand in the victory that Christ has won for us. Amen.